let her encourage me this week because I felt rotten all week. Before I get a cold, a man flu, whatever you want to call it, you girls want to call it. Before I get a cold, I always feel awful. I get a sore throat, a headache, and I feel really depressed. And then all of a sudden, then uh, once it starts coming out, you don't feel so bad. So a bit groggy today. But I was just feeling that. And I was reading this about Paul, all that he went through. I mean, you think of it. He went through, he was writing this from prison. And he had lots of things to contend with, but yet he kept saying these things, rejoice. And in, I think Paul's leading us in chapter 4, rejoice. And I say it again, rejoice. I mean, all that he went through, he could rejoice in that. I mean, even the point where people, these people were preaching in uh, their own selfish ambition. He said, look, I rejoice because they're preaching Christ. He learned to be content in all things, no matter what. And I think as we look on in this chapter, we'll realise, I hope, actually how he was able to do that. What revelation he had from God. And we'll see that later. Rejoice. So here Paul, in this letter, he talks about count, counting. In other words, he's making an evaluation of his life. Paul was a very good and upstanding member of the community and he was evaluating it. He was counting, he was making an audit, in a sense, of his life and saying, actually, have I got what it takes to become, uh, to be saved on my own merit? What do you think? No, I don't think so. But here, if you see in uh, verse 1, he says, Father, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's not trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it's a safeguard for you. What is he talking about that? Before he gets into uh, losing everything for the sake of Christ, what brings him to this subject is the fact that these Judaizers, I can't even pronounce that word, Judaizers, these kind of, they probably proselyte Jews, that means they were Gentiles, Gentiles converted to Judaism, they were coming in and causing havoc within the church at Philippi. I'm going to rewind just so you know who these people are, just to give you some understanding of the scriptures of the New Testament. Now, Jesus was a Jew. That might shock you. And he came to the household of Israel. He said salvation is of the Jews. And we see in Acts at Pentecost, this was a Jewish festival where the power of the Holy Ghost came upon them and they preached and all these people got converted. You'd have probably had um, true Jews by, by birth. Then you would have proselyte Jews and maybe even some from Samaria. All of them got saved and then they went out and proclaimed how amazing that Jesus was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah that came and fulfilled what he was supposed to fulfill. But then we see something happen in Acts chapter 10 where Peter, again a Jew, had a vision and a sheep came down to him and it says, get up, kill and eat. That's what the Lord said. He said, oh, I haven't even put ate anything impure in my life. He says, do not call what is impure. Do not call what is, I call clean impure. And then, as you know, in the house of Cornelius, he also had a dream and brought them together. And then through that, he realised that the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles. <laughs> you can imagine the upstir this might have caused in, 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 in Jerusalem. They actually held a conference about it. But then Peter then went on to then discuss exactly what happened. And they said, well, so it's the Gentiles are getting saved as well. <gasps> My goodness. And then Paul, the apostle, he was out, he was called to... He met with Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was called to preach to the Gentiles. And he even called Peter into account and said, look, you're being a hypocrite. You're doing this with the Jews, doing this with the Gentiles. And then they also, he, they came and then they agreed with Paul and they gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship to go and preach to the Gentiles. So originally it was for the Jews, but because the Jews rejected Jesus, the Messiah, the time of the Gentiles, you see. Now we had this discussion, the leaders, that not forgotten about Israel. There's going to be a time where they are going to be grafted back in. But at this time, we all need Christ, the Messiah. 
Jews and Gentiles, and all throughout the world, only one way that we are saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Jews also will know, look upon them who he has pierced. So these were proselyte Jews coming into Philippi and they were saying, actually, you need to be circumcised to the Christians. You need to observe all the laws. You need to be like us to be saved. <coughs> Can you imagine that? Paul then says, if you look in here, watch out for those dogs, those evil do. Can you imagine calling, being called a dog? In fact, actually, it was what the Jews called the Gentiles dogs. And he's saying, actually, no, it's, it's these Jewish proselytes who are dogs. Why? Because if you think about what a dog in them days, these wild dogs, they would be everywhere. They'd be getting in all your rubbish. They'd be barking at you. Oh, you've got a bit of food. You'd be running down Jerusalem. Help! They'd be barking at you in the same way these Jews were barking false doctrine into the Gentiles saying that you have to obey the law, you have to keep the festivals, you have to be circumcised. And he's calling them dogs. But he also called them evildoers. What he means by evildoers is the fact that they believe that by their own works, by following the law, they could be saved. He calls that an evil work. And he calls those mutilators, some translation would say, those cutters. In a sense, as a Jew, you know you get circumcised on the eighth day. You all know what that is. I don't need to explain that to you. But he's saying actually it means nothing because actually it's circumcision of the, the heart. Circumcision of the spirit. And actually if we look in the Old Testament, back in Leviticus, it says exactly that. Even so... That was a sign, a physical sign. They still had to be, have that circumcision of the heart and of the spirit. And then Paul says this. For it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though myself I have reasons for such confidence. If anybody else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, come and challenge me, he says. Paul is basically saying, I think in the, it, it's quite provocative, this statement in the Greek. It's like, you think you're good? You think you're a good Jew? He said, come and look at my life. Anybody who's willing to stand up against me, I will show you my life and see if you can match up to me. I wonder if we get Christians that do that. Well, I don't want to run ahead of myself. So that's what he's saying, and now he says this. He goes on uh, to break down uh, five things, which I believe, I remember there's a guy called Dave Platt calls them the treasures of a wasted life. I love that, because these five treasures that Paul could boast in, complete waste of time without Christ. First one, he says this. I was circumcised on the eighth day from the stock of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was born a Jew. That means he was circumcised on the eighth day. The eighth day was the perfect time to get cut because that's the least time that you could actually bleed to death. So God knew this. That's why he put it on the eighth day. But it says I'm from the stock of Israel. I wasn't a proselyte Jew. I didn't get converted. I was born a Jew. And I was from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you know who the tribe of Benjamin were? The tribe of Benjamin were the ones who had the first king. Do you know his name? Saul. What's Paul's name? Saul. I wonder if he was nicknamed after the first king of Israel. I can boast in that. Not only that, I have his name. Benjamin, those are the ones where everybody else forsake, forsook David when Absalom tried to raise up himself as king. The Benjamites stood in and were faithful to King David. The Benjamites, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. So he had a good family heritage. 
Secondly, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In other words, he was, had a real good social standing. He could walk around and say, oh look, here comes, here comes Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Isn't he a good, upstanding member of the community? Another thing it says, he has great Bible knowledge. It says this, in regards to the law, he's a Pharisee. Interestingly, when we think of Pharisee, what do we say? What did Jesus say about the Pharisees? Hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. But actually, in Jesus' day, when they were walking about, Pharisees weren't known as hypocrites. What were they known as? Wow, here comes a Pharisee. This is God's messenger. This is a man of God. This is a, a holy man of God. We must listen to him. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be a Pharisee? That's what they thought about the Pharisees in that day. Bible knowledge. Another thing is religious activity. He says, as for zeal, I persecuted the church. In that time where Jesus came and he was proclaiming to be God, they were like blasphemy. So he was saying, I've got zeal. I'm persecuting these rascals. So they were like, yeah, go Saul. Sorry, I'm getting carried away now. <laughs> Religious activity. He was amazing zeal. Good morals. He was a really good person. That's what he says. In keeping the law, faultless. Who can say that? Now, admittedly, we're not talking about... Uh, he kept the law completely because we know that by scripture that's not right. But he was just saying that as for the festivals and all that, and as uh, an outward show of obeying the law, I was absolutely faultless. And Paul says this, all of these things that he was, he was a great family heritage, social standing, amazing Bible knowledge, religious activity, and really good morals. He says this in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things and consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteous of my own that comes from the law, but by faith in Christ. He's saying here that Everything that I had, I was an amazing man on the outward show of things. I count for loss for knowing Christ. Let's, let's look at it today. I wish I could have these on, on the board. I, perhaps I should have done that. I was going to use the pad, but Nikki's using it. Family heritage. Lots, lots of people may have got christened growing up. I've met lots of Christians that, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian because I've been christened. I've been going to church all my life. I've been bringing my kids up in church. I have a great job. I am a person of great social standing. I help out at, uh, in, in, in the third sector. I help lots of different charities. But also I do lots of wonderful religious activities, like toddler group, which is a good thing, by the way. I'm not... I work for Open Door, I help there, every week. Aren't I great? I do wonderful things for the Lord. And actually, I've never been in trouble. I find that I'm quite a good person. I get that when I talk to someone, I say, do you know the Lord Jesus? And they would say, well, actually, I tried to do the best I can. And they think that's going to get them into heaven. All of those things, let me ask you this. Are all those things, are you depending on those things for salvation? Because what Paul is saying, I class all that as rubbish. What does that mean? I'm not going to go too, too deep with this, Paul. I know, I think you're a bit edgy about that. <laughs> Paul said it was as dung. Let's understand what he's talking about here. Look, if you found it on your floor in the lounge... You'd probably put on some rubber gloves and a mask and you would corner off the area and you'd go, ah, not again! And you'd find somewhere to dispose of it. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to end there. You can understand what I'm saying here. He says, I count all that as that thing that's on the floor. That's a 
big contrast, isn't it? That's a big contrast. So the question to you not is, do you go to church? Do you help out? Have you got a nice car? Do you do uh, well at work? Have you got lots of friends? Do you lo do lots of religious activities? My question to you is, do you know Christ? Sorry I'm shouting, but I really want that to stick into your heart because do you know him? Because actually, the only thing that's going to get you there in that day you don't want Jesus to come up where you say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I didn't even know you. If you think that you can boast about anything in your life, you've got another thing coming because the only thing that is going to cut it is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the eternal life that I may know him, the one true God and Jesus Christ the Son. Do you know him? I just think of the rich young ruler. He was a pretty good guy. Jesus says uh, about what are the commandments. He says, look, I've done from my youth, I've obeyed everything. I've been a good person from my youth. And then Jesus says, actually the one thing you need to do is go and sell all you have and follow me. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. Jesus was saying, like, why are you calling me good? You obviously know that I am the only one that's good. Go and sell all and follow me. And what happened to the rich young ruler? He went away really sad. Didn't want to lose all his money. So is there anything you're holding on to today that you're trusting in, that you're wanting more than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ? He says here in verse 7 here, Actually, verse 9, and be found in him not having a righteous of my own. That comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Uh, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. We so often put the cart before the horse. We say, look, we, we, we believe in Christ, but we do this because it will get me there. But actually, faith comes first. Our relationship with the Lord comes first and knowing him and out from that then flows all the wonderful things. But we don't trust in those things. We trust in Christ knowing that we're secure in him, that we're going to be with him forever. Righteousness of Christ, that's the most important thing. Secondly, in verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes. How can you say that? I want to know Christ, yes. To know the power of his resurrection. Again, I've said this before, how do you know you're living uh, a, a life for Christ? It's because the resurrection life, is that evidence in your life by the death of your old life and your resurrection life shining through that people say, this guy knows Jesus. The second thing here, which is what I want to talk about today is, and the partition of his sufferings. That's a really interesting one. In the King James, New King James Translation, it's fellowship of his sufferings. And as I was reading this, it's only come to me yesterday when I was reading. Sometimes we fellowship in our own sufferings, don't we? We like to feel sorry for ourselves. I do. I'm putting my hand up here so not to make you feel condemned. We do. We, we really fellowship in our own sufferings. And we say, oh, look, I'm really struggling. And it is a struggle. The Christian life is not easy. It's difficult. But we also fellowship in other people's sufferings, which is important because Paul said that's what we should do. But Paul says, amongst all this, all the stuff that's going on, I'm suffering, the church is suffering all around me. He says, look, I want to fellowship in Christ's suffering. What a difference. Do you know, I think if we can grab something from this today, it would be to fellowship in his suffering. Paul was thinking, I mean, all the things that he went through, he was beaten, left naked, he was shipwrecked, he was left for dead, but he was saying, actually, that's nothing compared to what Christ went through. Because Christ didn't only just have the physical aspects of his suffering, but actually, spiritually, he took upon the sin of the whole world. If you think when he came over Jerusalem, he sobbed and wept because everyone was rejecting him, because he knew what was to come. 
Jesus is coming to judge the world, but yet he's saying, look, I've come that you may have life now. And he suffered on the cross. And I'm wondering if today we could actually get our eyes off of ourselves, keep our eyes on others, but actually get our eyes upon his suffering. Because if we do that, that's where you will have that mentality and that heart of Paul where I can say, in all things I've learned to be content. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything give thanks and pray and petition that the peace of God will transcend all understanding and guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. How, how we need our hearts and our minds guarded today. Because that's where the stronghold starts. But I think that's what we need to do. Uh, Paul said, I'm determined to know one thing among you, Christ crucified. That's what he's saying. Let's participate in the sufferings of Christ because in comparison, it's nothing. Fellowship in his sufferings. I thought that was so powerful when that came to me. Uh, it wasn't my revelation. I read it in a commentary. So amazing men of God have gone before us and seen this stuff who help us as preachers. It's just phenomenal. But let that settle in your heart for a moment. And I want to just say this. I want you to consider, while we just sit here, to evaluate your own life. Make an audit or account of your own life and think, actually, all these things that I do, I'm really proud of. This is definitely going to get me into heaven. Going to church every week. Come to church every week. That's a good thing. But actually, no. One of the things you need to is know Jesus. You've heard that our righteousness is as filthy rags. If you think of a uh, it's not a builder, a mechanic's, um, cloth, you know, where he's wiping his hands all the time, and you like, comes up and he's wiping. Can you imagine having that in a food, a restaurant? You would say, no, I'm not eating there. But that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, all of your righteousness, all the things that you do, all the good things that you do are like filthy rags. But that's not to say to beat, beat yourself up. It's a good thing to do all these things. But he's saying that's what they are because you need Christ's righteousness because he is the only one that's good. He is the only one that's going to save you in that day because he is perfect. It's Christ's righteousness. Now I just want to uh, go to verse 12. Not that I've already obtained it. This is Paul speaking. Or already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of what uh, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider my life yet to have been taken hold of it. But the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is head, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me in heaven within Jesus. So I am not saying this to heap condemnation on you or myself. Because we have a chance even now as we hear the word of God to actually not look back. To think, okay, well I haven't lived my life for you, maybe I haven't known you as I ought to, but now I want to press on. Because God is a God of forgiveness, he's a God of love, and he is our Father. And there's nothing, nothing, that's going to stop him from loving you more than he has. As I said before, the I love you from God has been settled on the cross. But what he's saying to you is, okay, now you've got a new chance. To know me. Do you know Jesus? If, I, if that's the one thing you can take away, take it away today. Now, I was reading this morning, This, as Paul would say, we're coming into landing now. I like that, that's good, I like that. Does anybody know who Charles Wesley and John Wesley are? Not that we knew them, they lived a long time ago. Amazing men of God, Charles Wesley wrote, And can it be that I should get... And that wonderful, isn't it? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. My chains fell off, my heart was three, and all, all that stuff. Interestingly, when you look at their life of John Wesley and Charles Wesley, uh, do you know that they went to Oxford University? Did you know they even had a holiness club? Do you know they were ordained, both of them? They both preached the word. They both taught. They both wrote hymns. They went out and did missionary work all over the place. But none of them knew Christ. 
warm, yeah. You, you, you've just raised ahead of me now. No, 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 that's fine. I forgot about that. So I'll give you a gold star for that. <laughs> Not one of them, even though they did all these things, these are ministers of God ordained in the Anglican church. They didn't know Jesus. They got saved within three, three days of each other, I think. But yeah, my heart is strangely warm. That was John Wesley. Isn't it phenomenal that even as a minister of a church, he might not be saved? Don't think just because he's a minister, he's a Christian. Because we have here in John Wesley and Charles Wesley, they did all the things, but yet they didn't know Christ. And when they knew him, they were like, whoa, it's amazing. It's a paraphrase, just can't remember what they said. So I'm saying to you today, really, it's so important because I don't want anybody in this fellowship, really don't, to stand before the Lord and he say, I don't know you. Do you know Jesus Christ? Today, perhaps if you don't know him, you can come to him because he is willing to save you, to give him his right, give you his righteousness and to put his spirit in you to give you new desires, a new life in service to him and trust only in him and his goodness. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that whatever we do in this life, Lord, we count it all rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. Lord, my prayer is, Lord, that Everyone in this room, Lord, would know you personally. Lord, we know there's different levels. Some pray more, some talk to you more. Lord, we're not condemning each other, Lord, but do we know you? Do we think about you? Do we pray to you? Do we want to read about you? Do we want to share with others about your amazing love? Father, we just pray that you would pour your spirit out upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.